This big ugly thing here is a PC, or more specifically an IBM PC clone from the late 1980s. And I used to be pretty uninterested in these. I felt they were all basically the same and had nothing that really distinguished one from another. And that's basically true. This is really not all that distinct from any other PC clone. Not to spoil the video, but the term kind of means what it says. There's nothing truly remarkable in here because if there was, it wouldn't really be a PC anymore. Still, the ways in which this is unique kind of highlight the struggle that manufacturers have had for decades against the monolithic nature of the PC platform. The amount of effort going into making really novel PC hardware in the 80s and 90s just wasn't all that successful, and frankly, it still kinda isn't. Everything's still pretty samey, because to make it much different would break compatibility, and then nobody would buy your machine. And Very few manufacturers are willing to put in the immense effort needed to make something that's basically the same as everything else, and works like everything else, but still has one or two very well executed new features. All the same, there was always an undying desire to make a PC that wasn't just another carbon copy. And some vendors hoped that they could differentiate their products even in this market where differentiation is by definition extremely limited. But most don't make more than a token aesthetic effort. And this machine shows off some of the more creative attempts I've seen. So we're gonna take a look at what makes it special and why it's still disappointing. So, the product is the Head Start Explorer. It was manufactured in 1989 and sold under several names. In the US, it was sold as Head Start. In the Netherlands, it was sold by Vendex. And in fact, both names seem to have been owned by Philips, who are also a Dutch company like Vendex, but I don't think they ever put their own name on it. Although, I did hear that there was one model with the Magnavox name on it. Never seen one of those. It's not clear to me which of these entities was responsible for originating the design, although as I'll get into much later, I think maybe none of them did. Now, from the jump, the first thing you'll notice is that it doesn't look very much like a PC. That is to say, it's not a plain rectangular beige box, but if we turn it around, and I drop one of the plastic covers, you'll see that it has a pretty conventional set of ports on the back. And from the permanently attached power cable, it's probably clear that this is what we now call an all-in-one machine. So like the iMac, this contains not only the core components of a PC, but most of the common add-on hardware that was installed in virtually every clone anyway in those days. So we've got a joystick interface, a video adapter, serial and parallel ports, all very common and important. Uh, and there's also a connector labeled disk. Now this machine has a built-in three and a half inch drive here on the side, but there's no room for a five and a quarter inch drive. Since this machine was made at the tail end of the 80s, those were still relevant. So there had to be some option to add one and they opted to do it externally. Now this is interesting because it uses a DB25 plug, uh, but the typical Shugart floppy interface you'd find in any normal PC uses a 34 pin plug. So I don't have a drive that fits this, but from the info I can find online, it looks like less than half the pins in the normal floppy interface were ever used, which makes me think this is an ordinary interface and could be adapted to a normal drive if I knew the pinout. On the same side as the floppy drive, there's also a port for a bus type mouse, which were pretty commonplace in those days. And this machine came with a three button model that seems pretty acceptable in my hand, although I haven't really put it through its paces too much. The original IBM PC, and honestly most PCs throughout the 80s, contained none of these components. Every single one of the features I just described normally came on a separate card that had to be plugged into a slot after you bought the machine or by the person selling you the machine. As the 80s went on, these features started getting integrated into some, but not all motherboards. By 1989, IBM was selling machines that had all these features and more built in, but you could still buy systems that had few or none of them. This machine was just obviously at the full integration end of the spectrum. This isn't a complete ready to use PC, of course, since there's no built in monitor. It's probably obvious that this machine was intended to have some amount of portability, but typical PC monitors at the time were 13 to 14 inches. So if they built one of those in, it would have been very difficult to move this around. And if they built in a little tiny eight inch display like Max had, it probably wouldn't have been very easy to read anything. The Explorer was in fact sold alongside an ordinary 14 inch display, so the complete system would have been three components if you count the mouse. And that's still pretty good portability compared to lugging around not just a monitor, but a big steel PC tower, a mouse, and a keyboard. And that brings us to probably the most undeniably useful feature this machine offers, which is the keyboard. 
It was, of course, very common for non-PC home computers in the 80s to have built-in keyboards. The Commodore 64, the TI-99, the BBC Micro, and pretty much all the rest did it this way. This is an Apple II, for instance, and you can see why I call these designs keyboard wedges. IBM never quite made a PC that fit this form factor, but a number of other companies actually did. There was the Compact XT from the Hong Kong company Laser. Uh, there was the Poisk, which was made in Russia, and there were a couple others, all of which John C. Dvorak called weenie computers, uh, including the Explorer, and sure enough, several of the machines he described were not terribly successful. But from what I understand, Tandy's weenie offering, the 1000 series, was. The Tandy 1000s are a story in themselves, since they weren't really clones of the PC, but of the PC Junior, IBM's weird failed attempt to hone in on the C64's market. There are a few hardware and firmware components in this machine that really don't map to a conventional PC, but most of the models in the line nonetheless came in pretty ordinary beige boxes. They were mostly distinct just by being made of plastic instead of steel. The 1000HX and EX, however, were their own thing. This one here is the HX. They both offered the capabilities of the Tandy 1000 line, but in a keyboard wedge design. And I get the impression they sold quite a few of them. The only real difference between this and the EX, I think, is that the EX had a five and a quarter floppy drive, whereas this has two three and a half inch, but they're otherwise pretty much the same. As far as portability, this is a lot more convenient than a machine with a separate keyboard, and since it's all plastic, it's a lot lighter than a PC tower. But it still takes up quite a bit of space, so it isn't very easy to carry. You can't really get it under your arm, and there's no handle, so while it's lighter than a PC, it's still pretty bulky. The head start here goes a step further. It sort of finishes the work Tandy started by making the keyboard collapsible. When it's not in use, the keyboard lives up here on top, and to access it, you just pull until it pops free. There aren't any releases, there's just a couple of plastic tabs here, and shockingly, the plastic hasn't crumbled in 30 years, so it seems they picked a decent polymer compared to a lot of contemporary manufacturers, just not for the drive cover here. I have to say, this keyboard is actually really good. I'll demo it for you properly later, but I can tell you now, this is my favorite integrated home computer keyboard. This is actually a topic I've always wanted to address, and maybe I'll cover it in detail in a future video, but in short, computer keyboards were criminally bad throughout the 80s. The IBM PC used a massively overbuilt unit that they borrowed from a much higher end workstation that they'd already designed, but the rest of the home computers sold throughout the 80s had keyboards that should have been illegal. The C64, the ZX Spectrum, the Apple II, the keyboards on these machines are painful to type on. Some of them look okay from a distance, but as soon as you go to use one, you find out that the keys jam if you type on them at any kind of normal angle. The tactile response is just non-existent, and often the computer itself can't keep up with your typing anyway. The head start, on the other hand, actually feels really nice, and one of the reasons for that is how little elevation there is. Most integrated keyboards float some distance off the desk surface, sometimes as much as like two or three inches, and even the Tandy has a significant rise from the front to the back of the keyboard. But if we go back and look at the head start here, this keyboard is pretty much flat. It basically looks like an ordinary keyboard that's just permanently attached to the machine. So you don't get RSI the moment you start typing on this thing like you do on an Apple II. And if you think I'm joking, you should try it sometime. The key switches on the head start are probably not what we'd call mechanical, but they're still not half bad. And it all adds up to a typing experience that's more than acceptable, which if you think about it, makes a lot of sense given that this is the only keyboard you can use. If you're going to be stuck with it, it ought to be decent, and it's a shame that other manufacturers didn't see it that way. But anyway, moving on. With the keyboard open, you can now see all the status lights uh, on the keyboard itself. Of course, you've got the typical num lock, caps lock, and scroll lock, but up here on the main chassis, there's some hints at the enhancements this machine offers. Uh, you've got the power light, of course, uh, but then you've got a turbo LED and floppy and hard drive access indicators. Now, the hard drive wasn't that exotic in 1989. Lots of people had them at that point, but I don't think most of the other commonly available portable machines had room for one, so this is fairly special. Despite hard drives being available, though, they were neither cheap nor mandatory. So Head Start didn't include one from the factory, but they did include a built-in controller, and when the user was ready to add a drive, they didn't need to open the machine up and futz with cables or screws or anything. 
Instead, the drive that Headstart offered, which was a 40 megabyte microscribe, came in a plastic caddy, sort of like uh, modern day server disk trays. And to install it, you just open this little plastic door that I've taped shut on the side and slide it in and that's it. Unfortunately, I don't have one of these drives. Um, I've heard they've all failed by now and the interface isn't one I can readily get a drive or an emulator for, so I haven't been able to mess around with this at all. By the way, the floppy drive status indicator, that doesn't seem like a very big deal, but they could have left it out and it's a good thing they didn't. Most PCs didn't have a floppy drive status indicator because the drive was right on the front of the machine. You could just look right at it and see the light. But since they put this drive on the side, if they hadn't put a light up here, it would have been really irritating. So that was polite of them. So the turbo light is perhaps the more intriguing element here, but there might be some debate as to how exciting it actually was for most users. Back in my X300 video, I described the concept of the plateau, a point in time when people stop upgrading their computers for long periods because they just keep doing the same things and don't need better capabilities. The fascinating thing about the PC is that the very first model was the first PC plateau. IBM designed it in 1981 with a 4.77 megahertz Intel 8088 CPU, and an enormous number of clones sold throughout the 80s did not improve on that at all. Almost all software throughout the decade was designed for that spec, and for most users there was no need or desire to go any faster. So while Intel put out quicker chips like the 286, 386, and 486, my understanding is that a lot of people never had any interest in upgrading to faster or more capable machines. Newer CPUs were more sophisticated, more expensive, and required more support hardware, whereas the original PC design was extremely cheap and easy to make. So the bottom end of the market remained basically unaltered pretty much until the 90s. In fact, even in clones that did offer speed improvements, you know, for the discerning user with a little bit more to spend, you often wouldn't find newer CPU designs. Several companies, including AMD and NEC, produced 8088 compatible chips that could work in a more or less unaltered PC board while still providing better performance. The NEC offerings were the V20 and V30, which didn't necessarily run at faster clock speeds, but could often execute more instructions per clock for a higher effective speed. Other chips, like the 8088-1, worked, as far as I know, exactly like the original Intel design, but were capable of running at higher base clock speeds. And that's what we have in this machine. The Explorer's AMD 8088-1 CPU can run at 9.54 MHz, so double the speed of the original PC and theoretically doubling the speed of any applications. I'm sure in practice there were often resource or bus issues that prevented a clean 100% boost like that, but I'm sure this would have been beneficial to anyone who actually was crunching any serious numbers at home. Of course, since the original PC design was so prevalent, some software simply assumed the CPU was running at 4.77 and wouldn't run correctly on anything faster. And that's why many PCs used to have turbo buttons. If you have a program that can't function at higher clock speeds, disabling turbo drops the machine right back to the original PC speed. The Head Start has this capability too, hence the indicator, but there's no button for it. I think you're supposed to change the turbo status by running a program from DOS before you launch an application. That's how the Tandy did it, for instance. Uh, but that would be a bummer if so, since I don't have the program that does it. And in fact, since I don't have the system disks, I might be missing a few other programs, as well as all the documentation, which might hamper my ability to demonstrate this machine fully. But this is still a good moment to fire it up, finally, and show you what it can do. As with all pre-ATX PCs, the power switch is a hard on-off toggle, and this one's here on the side, but it used a little plastic plunger originally, which apparently always gets lost. I've seen one picture of a machine that still had it, and a whole bunch of others that didn't, including mine, so I guess these tend to fall out somehow. It's still possible to hit it by shoving your pinky into the hole, and this sucks because even though it hurts quite a bit, you're never gonna bother using a tool for it because you know it'll be really fiddly and you'll miss the switch a bunch, so if you spend any significant time with one of these machines, your finger is gonna end up sore for the rest of the day, and you won't even have any pleasant memories to make up for it. So first, we'll need a monitor, and the closest thing I have is this awful little 14-inch Packard Bell VGA unit, 
and it's not even compatible with this machine. While the IBM VGA spec existed in 89, it hadn't yet become universal, and the majority of machines out in the world were probably still using the older EGA, CGA, or MDA video standards, including this one. I don't have monitors for any of those video systems, but what I do have is a wonderful little box called an MCE2 VGA, which converts all of them to, you guessed it, VGA, which this monitor can accept. On the back of the machine, curiously mounted on the serial port for some reason, is a switch labeled color and mono. We'll be talking a lot about graphic standards later, but in short, this machine supports two of them. We'll be running in color for now, but we'll come back to mono later, because there's some really interesting stuff going on with that. So anyway, here we go. So we actually get a nice splash screen on startup, and this wasn't all that common at the time. With most clones, you just saw a BIOS copyright and a RAM count. It is kind of annoying that you can't see the RAM on this one, but there's not much point to it. All these systems shipped with the exact same amount of memory, and there was only a single add-on module, which you can check for by just popping this lid on top. The slot on the left is for a proprietary RAM expansion, and the other is a normal ISA slot, which came with a right angle adapter, allowing you to install a single ordinary 8-bit expansion card. It has to fit in this cavity, and there's nowhere to screw it down, all of which seems pretty chintzy, but consider the Tandy 1000, which has an even worse configuration, where you have to use a unique non-standard adapter to get a normal slot at all, so this could be worse. There's no CMOS configuration on here either, but that was pretty common since most 8088 machines didn't really have any settings built in unless they were part of an add-on card. So you pretty much just turn this thing on and go. And now we can go. So we're sitting in a DOS prompt, and you might have noticed there weren't any prolonged floppy noises on startup, and the machine booted really fast, even though I don't have the hard drive. And that's because this is one of the few PCs that has an OS in ROM. DOS 3.3 is actually built right into the motherboard. You can't upgrade it without replacing some chips. There were a couple other machines that did the same thing, including the Tandy 1000, and like the others, this is a really bare bones install. There's nothing here other than command.com. There's not even a format utility. The machine shipped with a copy of DOS on a floppy that was probably more complete, but this one is just the bare minimum needed to read a disk and launch an application, just so you don't have to fish out a boot disk every single time you want to run a program. It's a convenient feature, although it would be nice if it had a few more standard utilities. That's not to say that there isn't anything else on here, though. There's actually a bunch of other files, but none of these can be executed. They're CMD and EXP files. And these are actually part of what you might call the real Head Start operating system, which I bypassed on startup by holding down Alt, because I didn't want to show it to you yet. But let me show it to you now. Welcome to Bulletin Board. Apparently that's what this is called, and it is, in fact, a GUI built right into the firmware of this machine. And I'm gonna save you some time and let you know right now that it sucks. It is kind of aspirational, though, and I'm very curious about its history. It's not based on or even inspired by any extant windowing system, which makes sense since it doesn't actually have windows. It's graphical, but it's hardly what we would call a GUI. This machine post-dates Mac OS by five years and Windows by two, and both of those had movable windows and customizable desktops with movable icons, but this has none of the above. The desktop is completely static. All the icons are hard-coded. They can't be moved, you can't alter them, you can't add any shortcuts to your own software, there's nothing. What you see is what you get, which makes sense given that there's no writable onboard storage. Besides the clock up top and the control panel down the corner, the rest of the icons here are typical productivity type applications. There's a calendar and date book, uh, there's a calculator, a contact book, a word processor, and a database. But unfortunately, all of them are absolute token efforts. Now, as I mouse over to these, you'll notice that the cursor has this huge do this banner hanging off of it. And it turns out this is actually a, a sort of a novel UI concept where the mouse cursor has a kind of built-in ever-present tooltip. In the 80s, there was a lot of you know, computer usability research and speculation going on, people throwing spaghetti at the wall, and I imagine somebody thought this was a brilliant idea, but even most of the built-in apps don't really do anything with it. The cursor just says, do this all the time, except when it turns into a plain pointer, so that kind of feels unfinished. Anyway, let's check out these programs.
The Datebook is probably the most sophisticated app in here. Um, it actually supports Y2K, so I was able to put in today's date and it shows an accurate calendar. The rest of this works like you'd expect. You can just put in an appointment on a given day, you can describe it in some way, and you can mark it as an anniversary so it repeats yearly. Other than that, you've got a full text search feature. Uh, you can jump to a specific day by typing it in. Uh, there's a to-do list, which isn't tied to any particular day. You can print your date book uh, and you can click info to see how much space it takes up on disk. And that's pretty much it. So this is pretty bare bones, but it is at least a finished, nominally useful program. An interesting thing happens when you launch the date book or try to save. It asks you to insert your Explorer data disk and it won't accept just any old formatted floppy. I think it's looking for a disk that's been blessed as it were and I'm guessing they included one with the machine that was labeled you know, user data to simplify a new user's notion of where their files should be stored so they don't just write them onto the system disks for instance. Now, when saving the datebook, it will accept any disk if you bypass the warning, but it then creates a folder on the disk called Explorer. This is used to store a label, since bulletin board will actually show a disk icon if it detects one in the drive. This appears to be the blessing process, making that folder. So once it exists, you won't get those errors. Now there's another way to create this directory, but it's kind of odd. If we click on the computer icon in the corner of the desktop, this opens up the uh, control panel, although it has very few settings. You'd think you'd be able to set your desktop colors at a minimum, but nope. Besides setting the time, which all computers supported, there's exactly two settings in here, whether the machine boots into bulletin board or DOS on startup, and which graphics mode to use, which we'll talk about later. That's it for the settings, literally two bits of data not even a nibble. Besides those, the only other features are buttons that'll either drop you out to DOS or let you erase a disk. But it doesn't say format because while I think it is formatting the disk, it doesn't only do that. It erases it and then it puts the Explorer folder on there, which seems, I would almost say scummy, but Really, I would just call it sloppy. Erase disk does not mean erase and then put some junk on it. Although I guess Windows has been doing it for eons, so who am I to talk? So anyway, no customization at all. Let's go look at the next program. The calculator app is incredibly basic. It has nothing beyond the essential operators and the memory buttons. It does have an adding machine tape on the left side so you can see your calculation history and you can even print it out, but that's about it. If you're curious, even though you can see the desktop, you can't actually interact with it in any way. It's just, it's just kind of there. Next up is this address book, which again is the absolute bare minimum. It does at least offer buttons to flip to specific sections, and there is a find feature so you can search through your contacts, but when you add a contact, there aren't actually any data fields. It's literally just a freeform text blob. There isn't even a distinction between the name of the entry and the contents of the entry. There's no phone number field, no address field. It's just a text file indexed by letter. The best part is there isn't even like a flat listing. You can't see a summary of all your contacts. All you can do is go to a section and then click the next page button over and over to flip through contacts one at a time. So this is one of those computer desktop metaphors that's worse than an actual desktop that it's trying to simulate. I would call this uh, probably worse than nothing. The next app is a word processor and it's hands down the worst graphical text editor I've ever used. It has laughably few features and again, hasn't bothered to crib anything from other GUIs that could have justified its existence. Now the first problem I should mention is uh, if you're actually a decent typist, you won't find this usable at all because interface is so slow, it can't keep up with more than a few words per minute. So suppose I artificially throttle my typing speed here. So that seemed to do all right, but uh, let me now try it at my normal speed. Yeah, that, uh, that doesn't look like it did so well. It's in Arido small ops fatal. I think I started typing in Swedish. Black and yellow, let's shake it up a little. I've been sort of cutting up this footage, so you may not have noticed, but this is a universal problem with the whole bulletin board system. 
it's slow, really slow. And maybe that's because it's running on an 8088 and even at double speed, that's really not fast enough to do what this is doing, but that's not the case. And I'll show you some proof of that later. In any case, since there's so little you can actually do here, I'm not sure it makes all that much difference. There's so little functionality in this word processor. It looks at first like it might support rich text. It's got bold, italic, underline up here, and that stuff does work, but there's only one font, there's no font sizes, and once you've entered text, you can't go back and make it bold, italic, or underline. You have to erase it one letter at a time and retype it. This wouldn't be so bad if anything worked the way it should. If the insert key switched between insert and overwrite, like any normal text editor, you could just type over the text. But instead, you just get this miserable buzz. And if you could highlight a whole line and delete it, that would save you time backspacing, but that doesn't work either. The only way to delete text is to mouse up to the select text button, this is the only time that it actually uses the mouse cursor tooltip. And then click the first character, and then click the last character. And now you can't do anything other than cut or copy. You can't delete, you can't change it in any way. All you can do is cut or copy. So if you wanna get rid of the text, you have to just cut it and then never paste it anywhere. I don't get why you would leave a word processor this unfinished. There's features that are obviously missing here. They must have known were glaring omissions. Why does pressing delete not delete the text that's selected? That had to have been obvious even in 1989. This thing is bizarrely feature free. There is a search function, there's a spell checker that requires a disk I don't have. You can of course set your margins, but that's it. Those are all the features. And I'm not gonna say that this is pathetic compared to what the average person would have had in 1989 since decent word processors were still pretty expensive, but it feels like it doesn't have an excuse to be as limited as it is, given how many better programs the developers could have cribbed simple but significant improvements from. It sucks way more than it has any right to suck. The final app here is a rudimentary database, and I mean really rudimentary, but it's also really a database, admittedly. It lets you save multiple files, and for each one, you can create a series of fields, which it calls lines. So uh, suppose I wanna keep track of my collection of junk. So I'm gonna make fields for name, description, location, and I'll make a numeric field called cost. And having done so, I can now go to browse, and I can click add page to put a new item in the database. So you could use this for the sort of thing I'm doing here, or you could use it for storing recipes, or you can make a better contact book or something. And then once you've populated this data, you can then use the full text search to find it in the database. So I guess this is probably the least terrible program on here in terms of trying to do a thing and actually getting fairly close to the minimum viable product of the thing. This database program is at once aspirational and shockingly barren in functionality, and that's really a description of bullet and board in general, since you've now seen everything it can do. The only remaining feature is a very limited file manager that you can use to explore inserted disks, and it's so basic that it doesn't even have file associations for your built-in applications. The only files you can open are executables. The software included on disks with the machine, from what I've been able to scrape together online, wasn't much more exciting than a paint program I've never heard of, a copy of GW Basic, and a simple computer tutorial package that shows you how to use DOS and that sort of thing. None of which run inside this GUI anyway, and I don't get the impression from the marketing materials that Head Start had any option for making your own programs for it. So I think what you see is all you'll ever get. When I told you this GUI was disappointing, I really wasn't kidding. I'm not even sure why Head Start had it made. I feel like they would have been better off licensing the Gem desktop environment, which had been available for years at this point. I'm guessing that cost quite a bit, however, and this probably didn't. I think this GUI was created mostly to impress unsavvy buyers with a flash of colorful graphics, so they would buy the system thinking it might be similar or even better to those Macintosh computers they'd seen in magazines or the first episodes of Seinfeld. 
It would be months later, if ever, when they realized how little they got for their money. That said, you would have spent a lot less on this machine than the ones you might have compared to at the time. In 1989, any Macintosh you would get was going to cost well over a thousand bucks, more like over 2000 while the Explorer, even as PC clones go, was pretty inexpensive at only about $600 base cost. So it's almost surprising they bothered with the GUI ruse at all. The sticker price of this machine looks pretty competitive to me all on its own. I'm not sure how much the hard drive add-on cost, but $899 would get you the complete kit of PC, monitor, and a custom stand that let you fold the keyboard up and shove the whole machine underneath the display to save desk space, which is honestly so cute that I wish I'd been able to get the whole setup. In general, the chassis is the most interesting thing about this machine. The rest you could get elsewhere. but. The chassis is really neat. It's got a folding keyboard, a lightweight plastic case, and a bunch of built-in peripherals in a nice compact package. This was a really neat offering at the time. In fact, one of my favorite very subtle features is the cavity on top here, which seems to be made to accommodate the keycaps when the keyboard is closed, but it also serves as a convenient place to put floppy disks when you're using the machine. It's the perfect dimensions for it. In fact, you can totally put some discs up here and then close the keyboard with them inside for convenient transportation. But I'm not sure if it's a good idea or if Head Start actually intended it. If it wasn't by design though, they missed a bet. So maybe none of the above gets you excited and I wouldn't blame you for that, but let's at least focus on the positives. This thing is cheap and the fact remains that it is a 100% IBM compatible PC. And because the plateau was in full effect, any machine fitting that description was still a powerhouse. And this thing is no exception. You can run anything that fits in 512K of RAM and that runs on DOS 3.3 or any other version you can boot from a floppy, which in my testing goes up to at least version 5.0. Obviously, if you don't have the hard drive, that's a limiting factor, but even without those, PCs were usually expected to have two floppy drives, which this doesn't. On top of that, the drive in this machine is only a double density 720K unit, which is why all my disks have tape over the high density window here. Now, that was probably still reasonable in 89, since the 1.4 meg disk had only been introduced by IBM in 87. It was probably still pretty new technology. And if you're careful, you can fit a lot in 720K. This machine will run Lotus Works, for instance, so you can do all your spreadsheeting and word processing and dataing base. It'll also run WordPerfect, but that program's just deathly boring to look at. It'll run just about any other 1980s productivity app, and it'll even run AutoCAD if you're the most patient drafts person alive. Seriously, it takes like uh, three or four minutes to finish drawing this fairly simple diagram of a fire hose nozzle. And of course, it'll run games, at least whatever games were available in these days that you'd want to play. Uh, we'll talk more about the graphics features later, but basically anything that runs on CGA will work. Uh, this here is Dangerous Dave. And here's World PGA Tour Golf. While this is the worst golf game I've ever played, it does run just fine. I was even able to fit Microsoft Flight Simulator onto one disc, and while it isn't a ton of fun at 9 megahertz, as a kid, I still would have loved this. What I think is really impressive though is this will actually run Windows. Most versions of Windows can't fit on a single 720K disk, but Windows 2.0 was actually designed to do just that. So if you've never seen it before, this is Windows 2.03. Now this is running in CGA's one bit monochrome mode for enhanced resolution, so it's not too visually exciting. Look at that beautiful rainbow. But you can see it's doing just fine. Everything's running perfectly acceptably, which is interesting. See, let's fire up Windows Write. This is actually the single biggest program in the whole OS. It takes forever to load, and it took me about an hour of carefully moving files back and forth to get one disk to fit both the program and the necessary Windows support libraries. So you couldn't really do what I'm doing, but now that I have done it, I can show you how Windows Write keeps up with my typing compared to the word processor built into the machine. 
keeps up just fine. Now, I type faster than almost anybody I've met, but this can keep up with no problems, while the built-in word processor struggles at more than a moderate pace, to be generous. Now, since this version of Write was intended to run usably on a machine with half this speed, I think it's clear that the Explorer's built-in applications aren't hampered by the performance of the hardware, but by the quality of the programming. I think this makes it obvious that Head Start did not shell out for the best quality software, and frankly, there's some indications of cost cutting in a few other areas as well. For instance, going back to the Turbo feature, there's really no reason to control that from software, and almost no normal PC clone did it that way, but it does save a couple bucks to not put a physical switch in the machine, so that feels like a cut corner to me. There's also the total lack of system customization in Bulletin Board. In order for the graphical environment to be any kind of compelling, I think it needed some kind of personalization and interactivity, but that would require saving settings somewhere, and I'm sure they didn't want to put an extra EEPROM chip on the board to make that possible. And honestly, Bulletin Board is sort of contradictory. It's not unimpressive as a software feat, except compared to the proper graphical environments that were already on the market. It wasn't easy to make something like that, which is why it's so strange that they stopped short of making something really genuinely remarkable or worthwhile. But I would guess that it just cost quite a bit of money to make it to that finish line, so they stopped short. Now, there's one more issue I found that might be an example of egregious cost cutting, but might not be, I can't be sure. I've sort of been saving it for last because it requires that we dive deep into the not-so-common graphics hardware in this machine, and that requires a lot of explanation about the history of PC graphics. You'll like it though, trust me. When the original IBM PC was released, it had two graphics card options. The Color Graphics Adapter, or CGA, was one of them. It was an incredibly limited graphics card that provided token color video. It sucked, and because IBM failed to release a successor for three years, it remained the lowest common denominator of PC graphics for basically the whole decade, something I've always been mad about. The primary video mode of CGA ran at 320 by 200 with only four colors, chosen from one of four fixed palettes, all utterly eye-searing choices that didn't really fit any application. The monitors IBM provided with these cards support a total of 16 colors, but only text mode applications could access all of them. There was no way to do it from the graphics modes. When the Enhanced Graphics Adapter, or EGA, came out in about 1984, it used the same monitors, but gave access to all 16 colors. And that's how we finally got action games on the PC that didn't look literally clownish. But by the time EGA came out, it was too late for it to become universal, so most software assumed you had a CGA card. In fact, because EGA came so late, and because CGA was so limited, there was actually room in the market for multiple other standards to thrive. The other card you could get with the original IBM PC was the Monochrome Display Adapter, or MDA, which, as the name suggests, was limited to monochrome, but on top of that, it also couldn't display graphics at all. It was a text-only device, limited to ASCII characters and a few crude box drawing shapes, and you simply could not use it to paint arbitrary pixels on the screen. The reason it existed at all is because the text it could display was phenomenal. While the CGA could display text, it usually did it with a hideous 8x8 font, and while it did have a high-resolution monochrome mode, it still maxed out at 640x200, and 200 vertical lines is just not great for readable text. The MDA's effective output, on the other hand, was 720x350, a much better resolution, and since it used a monochrome monitor with no shadow mask, the quality of the text it produced was outstanding. A PC with an MDA card produced basically the highest quality text of any computing instrument you could buy in the US at the time. I'm honestly not aware of anything else in the 80s that could render text that cleanly, because pretty much every other computer you could buy used a normal television monitor for output, usually with 240 vertical lines at most, if you were lucky. So if you were doing any serious work with your PC, you wanted an MDA card for good quality text. But if you wanted any kind of graphics capability, you had to have a CGA card. So really, you needed both. As the decade continued, some manufacturers put out adapters that combined both into one card and let you switch between modes, including the adapter in the Explorer. Up to this point, I've been running the machine in color mode, which acts like a CGA card. But if I flip the switch on the back to mono and restart, 
it starts out putting an MDA signal instead, which you can tell because the text is now a lot denser. Of course, this is totally incompatible with a normal CGA monitor. The timing is completely different, the signal lines aren't wired up the same, so while my MCE to VGA can handle it, a real CGA monitor couldn't. But while I don't have a CGA monitor, I do have an MDA one, and it looks a lot better, so let's get that instead. Now that is how an IBM PC is supposed to look. This is actually a monitor from a brother word processor that turned out to be MDA compatible. And if you look at it in a dark room, you can tell this would be a joy to write on. The text seems infinitely readable as if it has unlimited resolution, which was of course the point of MDA. And the amber phosphor is really easy on the eyes. Now, since I figure MDA monitors were probably pretty reasonably priced in 89, this capability, which Head Start could have left out of the machine, is the saving grace if it still needed one. Including MDA support means that the Explorer can do basically everything that the IBM PC could do in 81, much of which was still totally relevant. But now, watch it do something the IBM PC couldn't do. Right, graphics. That shouldn't be possible. MDA did not do graphics, and this is certainly an MDA monitor, so something is afoot. And I now have to tell you about some deeper PC video lore, starting with the Hercules. The PC became extremely popular pretty much immediately upon release, and almost as quickly became the best solution to a lot of problems people had, but the graphics cards available at release were both really incomplete solutions. They left a big gaping hole in its capabilities, but it's in the PC's nature for the aftermarket to deliver a solution. As the story goes, in 1982, a man named Van Sawanical wanted to write his doctoral thesis on a PC in his native Thai language, but neither IBM card could render the Thai character set. So he developed his own card that used the same output specs as MDA, so he could use existing monitors, but offered adjustable fonts and per pixel graphics. That became the Hercules graphics card, which was extremely popular throughout the decade for anyone who needed to work with decent graphics or custom character sets on the PC. It only supported 1-bit monochrome, but at a resolution of 720 by 348. Support for Hercules graphics showed up all over the place, in tons of software and also in the Explorer. I have an application here that I developed to create a public domain example image for the Hercules wiki page, which is still there at the time of this recording, in fact. And as you can see, the program runs on this machine, albeit very slowly. So it clearly has Hercules graphics support in addition to CGA which adds yet more value to the Explorer. By integrating Hercules support, an even wider chunk of the IBM software repertoire was available. So all things considered, this machine offers a lot of capability, but at least with this specimen, there's a serious limitation. I should warn you, there are going to be flashing images on the screen here for the next couple minutes. So be careful if you're sensitive to that. I mentioned earlier that I was able to get Microsoft Flight Simulator running on here, and part of the reason I was trying to run that is because it's one of the few games, if you want to call it that, that has Hercules graphics support. But look what happens when I try to play it. Uh, part of the problem is that it's running very, very slow. Apparently at 720 by 348, even this 9.5 megahertz chip is struggling to render more than a frame per second. So the game is clearly unplayable at this speed, but an even bigger problem is that every other frame it renders is gibberish. Half the images are intelligible, but the other half are made up of meaningless streaks and dots. And I've had the same result with a couple other test applications I've tried, so clearly something is wrong with the Hercules support on this machine. I figured out what was wrong by using this Hercules test suite. It renders the first screen of video just fine, but again, the second one is nonsense in pretty much the same way. But notice that the working one says, this is page one. See, the Hercules card has two pages. In other words, it has enough video memory to store two full screens of picture information, which allows software to use a technique called page flipping to achieve smoother video by writing to one page while displaying the other and then flip-flopping after each frame is drawn. Now, in an emulator running the same program, both pages look fine, but on the Explorer, page two is always corrupted. 
Now, this could be due to simple hardware failure. I don't have a schematic for the Explorer, so I don't know which RAM chips are connected to the video controller. Maybe there's one chip for page one and one chip for page two, and the second one has just failed and needs to be replaced. I can't even find the video chip on the board to try to trace the connections in order to diagnose that, so I'm not really sure. But another possibility is that Head Start just cut some corners here and didn't supply all the necessary RAM. This was not an unheard of practice. There were graphics cards that used chipsets that supported 32 or 64 kilobytes of RAM, but were only shipped with 16. So while you can put the card in high resolution graphics modes, it won't actually function correctly. If the engineers who designed this thing mistakenly thought that the second page of memory wasn't likely to be used by most software, for instance, they might have tried to save a few bucks by leaving it out. And so the corruption that we're seeing could just be a random chunk of system memory that's there instead of a reserved video page. I admit this is speculation, but I don't know how to prove it other than just replacing all the RAM chips in the machine, which would probably do more harm than good. If anyone else out there has one of these and can run the same test, let me know the results. Leave a comment and we'll talk. I have a pretty dim view of clone manufacturers in the 80s. I think they usually cut corners and this is actually one of the better machines I've seen. And I'm hoping I'm wrong about this because proper Hercules support would really make this a great artifact. It's kind of hard to find a machine with that and the cards themselves aren't all that common these days. And honestly, other than the embarrassingly bad GUI and the single floppy drive, this seems mostly like a fantastic piece of hardware. If I could make the graphics work fully, I would be thrilled because I'd be able to run Windows on it. Windows in Hercules mode is pretty cool, and I think you can guess that it would look fantastic on an amber display, but it seems that the Windows Hercules driver runs entirely from page two, so it's completely unusable. That's a real shame, and even more so because the monochrome support on the Explorer is otherwise excellent. It even implements a CGA emulator. I hadn't known these existed before, but while testing this machine, I realized at one point I'd forgotten to switch back to my color display before launching a CGA game, but it just worked anyway. It turns out that with all the Hercules graphics cards out there, people didn't want to switch to color monitors all the time just to run software that only supported CGA graphics. And since Hercules has more resolution than CGA, it's fairly easy to double the pixels in one direction or both to make the CGA graphics fit the MDA format. So with a relatively simple software trick, you can actually adapt CGA software to output to a Hercules card. Of course, there's still no color support in Hercules, so they have to compensate by mapping the CGA palette to various dithering patterns. It doesn't always result in a legible display, especially for small color details, but Zaxxon is plenty playable this way, so that's good enough, right? So there's a ton of graphics modes supported by this thing, and if you can believe this, there's actually one more. There's one last graphics feature that I haven't mentioned yet, partially because it's very difficult to prove it exists beyond a magazine ad, this one here, which says that the machine supports, I think, 16 color CGA, which is a very interesting term because IBM CGA only supports four colors. But I can prove this machine doesn't have an IBM CGA chip in it just by rebooting. See those colors? Those aren't in any of the standard CGA palettes. I mentioned that CGA only supported four palettes, all of them extremely unpleasant, but this one doesn't look half bad, and that's because it's using illegal colors. Black, blue, light gray, dark gray, and white don't match up with any CGA mode, especially since there's five colors there. But this isn't all that shocking. Not too long into the PC's lifespan, several manufacturers started producing what were sometimes called super CGA cards that used APIs and hardware very similar to CGA, but added additional video RAM and circuitry to open up the entire 16 color palette, uh, offer higher resolutions, or both. These weren't actually forerunners of the IBM EGA, since when that came out, it added several new hardware features and a completely different graphics architecture, but they certainly provided welcome enhancements assuming you could find any software that worked with them. Since these cards weren't standard, software had to be custom written with support for every individual one. And while a number of larger software packages did this, like AutoCAD or Windows itself, the majority stuck to the IBM standards. So buying a card like this was fairly pointless unless you intended to write your own software or get programs that you knew explicitly supported it. The Explorer's graphics chip is basically one of these. Head Start ostensibly offered an SDK to develop software that worked with this chip, but of course it's long gone, and nobody was gonna bother making custom software just for this one machine anyway. 
Of course, the chances of this actually being a custom chip for the Explorer are next to nothing. There were plenty of existing chipsets that Head Start could have bought, and while I can't identify from the board which IC is the video controller, I would guess that if I spent long enough trying different programs, I'd find one that supported these extended modes. Unfortunately, Head Start didn't advertise what chipset this was, so if there was any software that supported it, there wouldn't have been any way to find out, which seems like a pretty boneheaded move on their part. But that seems on brand, because in the end, the Explorer is a mix of reasonable ideas and boneheaded ones, although I'd say it's more good than bad. I'm honestly kind of surprised that I haven't seen more of these on the used market. In 89, most PCs weren't much less intimidating or more convenient than they'd been nearly a decade earlier, and I would have thought there was a significant market that won something that wasn't a big metal box with a bunch of flying cables and add-on cards. If the Explorer was as much of a failure as it seems, I don't exactly know why that would have been. Maybe it was just difficult, this late in the PC's lifespan, to find a combination of a user with aspirations small enough to fit in this machine's limits, and a salesperson willing to accept the commission for a machine this cheap. It seems like everything I could find in the contemporary market, at least in magazines, cost at least a couple hundred bucks more than the Explorer, so maybe that's all there is to it. It just didn't cost enough. Of course, it could also have been marketed poorly. Maybe it was abandoned by the vendor. And I think that brings us back to the question of who really made this thing at all. It was sold under at least three names, Vendex, Head Start Technologies, and Magnavox at some point. But frankly, I doubt any branch of Philips really had anything to do with the design of the system. See, I got this machine about four years ago, but last year I was on eBay looking through various vintage PC listings and I came across the exact same system, no question about it. It's the exact same machine, but with no brand name on top of it. Every aspect of it's obviously identical, except for the name. On the bottom, there's a sticker that says JSN with a model number that doesn't match the Vendex or Head Start ones, but the FCC ID does pull up the filing made by Head Start in the US. So maybe they were the original designer and they licensed it to this JSN, but I think it's equally likely that this was really designed by some unknown Korean company and licensed to all these various names. The Head Start brand had certainly been used like this before, as LGR demonstrated in his video on another Head Start machine that turned out to pretty clearly be a Samsung design that was sold under a half dozen other brand names with only slight aesthetic modifications. This was rampant behavior in the clone market at this time, pretty much everyone was doing it. But at this point, I've run out of things that are facts, and I'm well into the guesswork and slander, so I think I've given you everything I can. I want to thank you all for watching. If you like this, consider subscribing to my channel. That lets me know that you're into this sort of thing. If you really liked it, then consider backing me on Patreon like these folks here are doing. It costs a lot to buy stuff and sit on it for four years before using it for anything. And the generous folks who support me over there are enabling that kind of behavior in every sense of the term. So I'm very grateful to them. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.